Mandy Friedman here, licensed professional clinical counselor, clinically certified domestic violence counselor, clinically certified trauma professional level two, and the creator of SNAP, Survivors of Narcissistic and Abusive Personalities. We are here to talk about weaponized incompetence. I can't wait. It gets me really going. And I'm with Tabitha McKinney. Hi, Tabitha. Hey, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing really well, and thank you so much for joining me on this topic. I'm really eager to get started. But first, would you mind introducing yourself to our audience a little bit? Who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? Yeah, so uh, I started my practicum at Claremont Mental Health last semester and continuing with my internship. Um, I would say as far as counseling goes, I'm trauma-informed, integrative by nature, and uh, really like to work a lot of somatics, focus on those breathing, teach some coping skills. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to dig into this because I actually am working with clients right now who have issues with uh, weaponized incompetence within their partnerships. Um, so yeah, ready to dive in. Now, at Claremont Mental Health, we focus on helping clients who experience interpersonal trauma, interpersonal abuse, narcissistic abuse, intimate partner abuse, intimate partner violence. So we wind up seeing a lot of patterns and sameness that occurs. We see some common features that come up. And one of the things that we see quite frequently is this concept of weaponized incompetence. Mm -hmm. Now, what is weaponized incompetence? We put together a little bit of a definition for you here, and that is a form of manipulation with the intent to avoid labor, effort, and responsibilities. How do you feel about that definition, Tabitha? Do you think that covers it pretty well? Are we missing anything there? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, um you know, this could be female or, or male, right? Um, but especially, I think, since COVID, we've seen a lot more women take on this responsibility um, when everybody's at home. Um, so there's a lot of feigned incompetence, like, oh, I don't really know how to unload the dishwasher, um, per se. So that's coming up. And we know that it's always been imbalanced, right? Um, that domestic labor being overlooked. Exactly. And when we say labor, we mean physical labor, mm -hmm. emotional labor, mental yeah. labor. Yeah. And in terms of effort and responsibilities, when someone is using weaponized incompetence as a form of manipulation, they're being lazy. Yeah. A little bit of laziness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe they're, <laughs> yeah, they're avoiding putting effort in. Yeah. But they're also avoiding that responsibility because if we avoid responsibility, we can also avoid blame, mm -hmm. criticism, right? Having to follow through, being held accountable. Yeah. So we're getting out of a lot of things when we use weaponized incompetence. It's not mm. just the work, it's what comes with work. Being, you know, hey, would you mind doing it this way instead? Or, hey, I like this better. They don't have to mess with any of that. Right. It's weaponized incompetence. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, who uses weaponized incompetence? Tabitha, can you start us off on this topic? Who uses it? Yeah, well, it originally started in the workplace um, for employees, co-workers to get out of doing certain tasks. Oh, they can't be trusted. So so-and-so will have to pick up the slack. But now we see it a lot in partnerships, um, marriages, however those look. Um, but even kids, you know, do it as well. Um, and that's partly due to, you know, lack of uh, maturity, emotional maturity. But Interesting. So emotional immaturity is a factor here. When a child is behaving in an emotionally immature way, that's appropriate. But when an adult is behaving in an emotionally immature way, that's yeah. indicative of some underlying deeper problems. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the word trust. You said cannot be trusted. And I just want to bold underline that word for a second um, and remember that we use the word trust. Um, the person cannot be trusted to handle the task. Um, mm -hmm. However, they're creating that distrust by appearing to be incompetent, but then that leaves other people feeling like they cannot be trusted. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So partners who perpetuate gender inequality would yeah. be someone else, you know, in terms of who uses it. Mm -hmm. These are partners who believe in stereotypical gender roles where the division of, of the labor falls on the woman to mm -hmm. do the domestic labor, that the man is supposed to go to work, come home, and then that's mm -hmm. it. Relax. Um, and maybe they wash the car, mm -hmm. they might rub the lawn, they mm -hmm. might do stuff on the exterior of the house. Um, but when it comes to the interior of the house, mm -hmm. you know, then it's up to the wife or the female partner then to be taking over managing the household and the children. A lot of times those women also have jobs yeah. too. Just want to mention. Yeah. <laughs> Full time. Full time. Yeah. Not always, but a lot of the time they also work full time. Yeah. Now it can also be seen in patterns of white fragility. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I just want to say, we're not like super smart. We just looked this up. We Googled it. So you'll find the same things. <laughs> if You Google it and you can see what they got on Wikipedia. It's exactly what we're reading to you, but we're, we're putting it all together within a framework of who does it? Why do they do it? What problems do they cause? Um, how can you notice that it's happening? You know, what are the kinds of things you're looking for? And then what can be done about it? And they don't do that on Wikipedia. So okay. you can only find this here. <laughs> <laughs> but when they brought up the white fragility portion, they're talking about marginalized populations and how those groups are expected to carry the responsibilities of correcting and educating that you know, if, if say, for example, you're in a workplace that is predominantly white, if you're the person of color, then it's up to you to point out the problems and explain them and how to fix them and why they're important. But really, you're not the one that caused the mess. You're not the one that's perpetuating the issue. And yet it's up to you as the person of color to carry that load. So that would also um, count as weaponized incompetence when a privileged group um, or the the normal group mm -hmm. like them to the issues of others. So, oh, is that a thing? Well, I've never experienced that myself, so I just didn't know. You know, tell me more about it. And you know, oh, okay. Um, gosh, I just didn't know. Really? Yeah. You never heard of that before? Mm -hmm. Sure. You didn't know. <laughs> Because <laughs> I think you probably did. So acting like the about something like that would be a form of weaponized incompetence. And again, I got to say it again, because you said it the first time, but I got to say it again. Emotional immaturity, you know, individuals that are not willing to evolve, grow, learn, change, take criticism, take responsibility, go, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, can't do that. I was wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I would you know, say there's a bit of narcissism wrapped up in here too. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, and that's how it winds up in our lap is because it does relate to narcissism. Absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we know when it's happening? What are the typical signs or indicators that weaponized incompetence is going, is, is happening in your world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the help, you know, isn't, actually really helpful. Um, you know, this could be, oh, they say they're going to load the dishwasher, but everything's just kind of a mess and then you'll have to do it over again. Um, you exactly. might even, yeah. Help isn't helpful. Mm -hmm. Yep. You might even regret asking for the help. So then you say, never mind, never mind. I got it. I do it myself. And then they're like, yes, mm -hmm. it worked. Mm-hmm. What are some other typical uh, signs or indicators? Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, a victim-like attitude from the underfunctioner. You know, I can't do anything right, you know, or I'm being emasculated. Um, so, yeah. right. I'm being emasculated. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a whole other video. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have like the tasks are not perform to completion. So then you wind up having to either finish it or do the majority of it. They just, they help and they do this much of it. They yeah. don't follow the routine. Mm -hmm. So 
they'll jump in to help, but then instead of doing it the way, especially when children are involved, you know, the kids are used to what the routine is. Now dad's helping and things are being done completely differently. And that messes everything up for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they're like, well, we, we want mom to do it. I'm like, see, they just want you to do it. They don't want me to do it. Well, the reason they don't want you to do it is because you're not doing it the way mom does it. And they're used to how mom does it. It's not about right or wrong or getting it, you know, that you screwed things up. It's just this is what the kids are used to. It's right. that simple. <laughs> just do what the kids are expecting. Right. Exactly. And the impact of all of that is now you're frustrated. Uh, so there's this sort of mischaracterization. And you you heard just a second ago, Tabitha used the word underfunctioner. So as we as we keep going through this video, we're going to use these two terms, overfunctioner and underfunctioner. The underfunctioner is the one that's using the weaponized incompetence. The overfunctioner is the one who's overfunctioning, obviously. Now, there will be a mischaracterization of the overfunctioner as being what? A nag, overly worried, difficult, controlling, never satisfied. Oh, you know, I'm sure we've all heard this in some in some way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And you know that word controlling. Mm -hmm. I gotta just slip this in here. Sometimes our clients um, <laughs> get, you know, will be described as controlling. Mm -hmm. And isn't that interesting because they're coming from actual controlling relationships where they were literally being controlled. Right. Um, mm -hmm. when, when survivors of abuse are using control, they're typically just trying to control themselves and right. controlling their environment and their resources. Mm -hmm. That's what they're trying to control. They're not trying to control other people. You should do this. You should do this. It's more, Hey, that affects me so could you not right you know that's more the control that our clients usually exhibit but because they're also ego dystonic always looking at themselves and maybe i'm the problem yeah then that really rings true like i am controlling i do like to do it my way mm -hmm. i do get upset when he does it and he does it wrong mm -hmm. so maybe i am controlling and you start to question yourself. It's like, no, you're stressed out. You're busy and you're trying to get shit done. That's yeah. what it's all. It's just you're trying to function in your right. world. And, and to function properly, we do need to have some sense of control over our environment. So that mischaracterization of the overfunctioner as being a nag and she, you know, she won't let me help. Mm -hmm. um, now that can be really upsetting for the person who's over functioning because they're doing acts of service they're working hard this is how they love mm -hmm. often the over functioner is someone who loves through acts of service and right. feels like that by taking care of everyone and doing all these things that that's how i'm loving my family i'm mm -hmm. loving my husband and my children by keeping a neat and tidy house uh, or by trying to Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm showing love and care by um, providing what meals people prefer, you right. know, and well, my, he doesn't like that. So I'm not going to make that for him here. I will make something separate for him and we'll make this for you guys. And now I'm making four different meals because we also have dietary needs for this child. Um, so those, those acts of service are acts of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I also hear you saying is that you're always actively listening as well you know i think a good partner who shows up does that and wants to do that so that you don't always have to kind of verbally communicate what you need although that's also important too <laughs> so we learn to anticipate the mm -hmm. needs of the people around us and that will tie into our childhood if you came from a family system where you were codependently enmeshed mm -hmm. um that you know what do you need what do you need and and, and making sure that everybody's taken care of. And yeah, so another thing that will happen is that we are left drained mm. with no time to take care of ourselves. We have no time for self-care. Yeah, it's, it's, It feels impossible. Now, let's say that you're at your wit's end and you're like, I'm doing self-care. I'm in therapy now. My therapist said I need to do self-care what would you need in order to incorporate a routine of self-care into that regular routine as the over functioner what would you need 
Yes, well, definitely a competent partner. And with a competent partner, you would naturally have more time. So you don't have to wonder, when am I going to do this? When I'm cooking, cleaning, picking up the kids, making sure they have everything that they need at school, um, all the things, you know, you're not carrying all of the mental load, emotional load, physical labor. Exactly. Now, this just this just popped into my head, but is absolutely true in that. Remember the part where we said that we regretted asking for help in the first place? Right. Mm -hmm. So this is another opportunity for that under functioner, the one who's using the weaponized incompetence. You're asking for self-care time. Mm. They're going to sabotage that for you. They're right. going to make sure that when you come back from that, things are worse. Mm -hmm. you wish you wouldn't have gone because now that's not self-care because mm -hmm. when I leave the house things go haywire and mm -hmm. then when I come back I have more work to do and messes to clean up because right. I wanted to go to a yoga class so you mm -hmm. know what it's not worth it I'm not going to the yoga class and you shut the self-care down because when you try to do the self-care your responsibilities and labor actually increases when you're with a partner like that yeah yeah and then they might even do weaponized guilt you know, oh, you see what happens when you actually make time for yourself? Everything falls apart. Yeah, exactly. Mm -mm. Now, another thing that will happen is you'll be undermined as the parent. Mm -hmm. So here you are, you wind up being the authoritarian too with the kids because you'll be the one that's boundaried. You'll be the one that says no um, often. And yeah. So since you're the one who's working hard and trying to keep things straight, you're pretty serious a lot of the time, maybe you're busy, you're stressed, you got, you're in a hurry. Uh, and then here comes dad and he's happy and relaxed and fun one. Yeah. And you know, don't listen to your mom. You know, she's stressed out right now don't uh -oh. listen to her. But right. mom said, we can't do that because it's okay. We'll do it anyway. Just, you know, mm -hmm. wait. And so you get undermined or, you do ask for help with the children. Hey, so-and-so did such and such to somebody. Can you step in here and help me with this conflict with the kids? And then you wish you didn't because the person comes in like gangbusters, causes more problems, escalates the situation, <laughs> doesn't de-escalate it. And you're like, okay, yeah. I can't ask for that help either. Another sign of weaponized incompetence is that someone might be doing like a task that's not essential, but then claim that they're doing their part. See, I did that. Um, maybe they're taking out like a trash can that wasn't even full to begin with, you know, so unnecessarily doing things um, just to make themselves look good when they're not doing their part at all. Exactly. Well, I changed the oil in the car. I, you know, I changed the oil. Yeah, you spend all Saturday changing the oil when Jiffy Lube can do it in five minutes for 25 bucks or something, you know, like you right. could take that up the road and then come home and help me with everything else that needs to be done today. But instead you're going to spend four hours on something that a doesn't need to be done right now. B mm -hmm. someone else could do it quicker and cheaper than what you're doing in terms of how much time you're spending on it. Plus yeah. you made a mess while you were doing it and left your tools everywhere, left mm -hmm. your mess everywhere. I had to actually come back behind and clean it up because the kids were playing with the parts you left out. Right. Exactly. But you changed the oil. Mm -hmm. So Good his, job essential task is now creating more work for you. Yeah. And it's not essential. Right. You know, I love all the TikTok stuff we got going on now and the reels that we can watch where people are so creative in um, illustrating and performing role playing these moments. Yeah. Uh, and I saw one the other day where, you know, it's like the, the, the man and the woman and they're having like a, a conversation the woman's like listing her tasks of what she did over the weekend mm -hmm. and then he's like um it, what she needs to do and he's getting ready to walk out the front door he's like okay well i'm gonna go out in the yard and you know that limb that's been hanging there for six months i'm gonna go take that down i'll be back in four hours you know and then he leaves and she's like <laughs> wow you know yeah. but then he comes home feeling like a big strong man i did some labor out in the yard right. didn't need to be done nobody cares mm -hmm. in the meantime we had this 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 that needed to be done i took care of that oh and don't forget then at the end of the day when we're all heading to bed together and now it's supposed to be sexy time 
Yeah. No. Mm-mm. No. And now it's she doesn't like we don't have sex enough. Blah, blah, blah. Well, she's tired. Yeah. Right. She's exhausted. She feels imposed upon. She doesn't feel supported. She feels undermined. And guess what? That does not do much for our libido as women, does it? <laughs> oh, and then also she feels like she's taking care of a child. So that would be weird, right? <laughs> Right. So if you turn into the mommy because we have an emotionally immature underfunctioner who uses weaponized incompetence, not mm. sexy, no, not no. sexy. Mm -mm. Mm. No. Mm. OK, so those were a nice list of typical signs or indicators that weaponized incompetence is happening in your environment. Now, we're going to talk about what problems it causes. Resentment, first and foremost, is this underlying resentment and feeling pissed off that there is an imbalance that is unrecognized. So it's not just that the imbalance is happening. It's also that we're pretending like it's not happening and being gaslit about it quite a bit. Um, or our concerns are minimized or laughed off or we play the victim. They play the victim card or they start mischaracterizing. And so if you even go to express anything, you get shut down. So that resentment starts to build up. Now we're pissed the stress that it causes. You're under an emotional stress, a mental stress, and physical stress of getting everything done. And that can affect your medical health, your mental health, your sleep, and, and your other relationships. It also gets in the way of being a present and effective parent. When you're that stressed out, your kids are getting the scraps of you. Even though you're taking care of everything, you're not mentally present the way that you would like to be because you're just flying through the day trying to get things done. Also, distrust. And this is one that I've actually had to explain to partners myself before, that the client is trying to explain this to the partner. The partner is not accepting <laughs> the explanation. And I'll, they'll show up in a session with me at some point, and then I'll be like, we need to talk about this feeling of distrust. Mm -hmm. Because when you say to your partner, I don't trust you, Typically, what we mean by that is that we mean that you don't trust them in the sense that they're going to do something shady behind your back, like cheat on you, lie to you, hide money, um, you know, that they're not trustworthy people. Mm -hmm. But that's not the kind of trust that we're really talking about here. When you're with a partner, you need to be able to trust that they have your back, that, that you can go, OK, I am going to yoga. And I can relax at yoga, focus on yoga. And I know when I come back, everything will be fine. And I'll feel good about having gone to yoga. Yeah. But if we don't trust our partner to have our back, we're not going to trust them to manage the things that we manage. And then that's going to um, make us feel like that we're a party of one. Mm -hmm. You know, who has my back? I do. <laughs> All right. Yay. <laughs> and then abandonment, mm -hmm. feeling alone, feeling not heard, not known, not appreciated. Um, yeah, the party of one that, well, okay, I guess I'm in this by myself and it's an invisible thing that only exists to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and though I'm putting my whole heart and soul and brain into everything, getting no acknowledgement for that at all. And in fact, being treated like that I'm some sort of a dictator jerk in the house because I would like for you to wipe up after yourself or put something away. Mm -hmm. So you feel alone in the relationship. But what are some other problems that it might cause, Tabitha? Yeah, well, poor modeling, um, you know, definitely risk reinforcing stereotypical gender roles. Well, it doesn't risk. It does reinforce that. Um, so, you know, that's one thing, certainly. Um, and you touched on this um, earlier when you were talking about stress. It creates health problems, right? When we're not creating enough time for self-care, we don't exercise, or maybe we just want to eat that junk food that's really easy, um, so health definitely can be affected negatively. Um, one person becomes the go-to person, the default, or, um, who was the author we mentioned? Oh, um, Eve Rodsky calls it the she-fault. 
um, when maybe uh, the female um, is the go-to person. So again, she's carrying the mental load, the emotional load. Um, and yeah, mental and emotional labor is not acknowledged. You're not even thanked. There's no gratitude um, for all the things you're doing, carrying all the weight. Um, and yeah, feeling like the hard work doesn't even matter. Um, and because maybe you do it so seamlessly from that place of love, because it's your love language, um, they don't notice that it's hard to juggle and to manage day to day, morning, daytime, night. I mean, yeah. Exactly. So that, that can leave you pretty depressed mm -hmm. and trapped and sad and yeah. lonely. Anxious. Um, and then when are you going to go to therapy? Right. You know, like, right. How are we going to take care of this now? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, dude's playing video games. Right. I'm yeah. not making this up. I yeah. am not making this up. This is not, this is just the experiences that people have. We're reporting in. Um, it's yeah. amazing how many women experience this in their relationships and it is a problem and it's been a problem for a long time yeah. a long long time yeah but we have tiktok now so you're <laughs> <laughs> being yeah, social media, media. <laughs> and learning some things <laughs> social media can be positive yes, it sure can um, it can highlight societal problems and issues that are private that go on behind closed doors that we haven't had a chance to talk about. And now we can name it, say what it is, and maybe do something about it. Um, and that's our next uh, and, and last section that we're going to go over on this topic, which is what do we do about this? A moment ago, Tabitha mentioned Eve Rodsky, the author, and this is her book. It's called Fair Play. And that's what this whole book is about, is what to do about this problem. It describes the problem uh, and then also gives specific instructions of what to do. And I believe there's even sort of like a card game you can buy that goes along with it. Wow. So I highly recommend this book if you are seeking to uh, correct this problem in your life. But Tabitha, can you go over some of the things that we already know about that could be helpful? Yeah, well, I mean, having healthy conversations about this, I mean, this is something that needs to be addressed, obviously, because it's not just assumed shared responsibility. Um, so in these conversations, you want to be be specific, give concrete examples of how, you know, your partner's feigned incompetence makes you feel, you know, let them know you're depressed, anxious, don't have time to take care of yourself. It's impacting your health. Um, while ideally we would like them to notice these things on their own, it often doesn't happen that way. So have the conversations. Yeah, so try to avoid blaming or accusing your partner um, instead of judging or being passive aggressive. Try focusing on your partner's behavior. Again, be specific, you know, um, maybe a quick little how to, you know. <laughs> so. Um, and set boundaries. We hear so much about boundaries, but here they're critical again. Um, you know, once your partner knows how the weaponized or feigned incompetence causes you strain, um, you can begin to set those boundaries and ex expectations and regarding the share of responsibilities. Okay, you're going to do this. I'm going to do this. Um, let's talk about it. And then once the boundaries are in place, be consistent um, and express clear consequences of continued weaponized incompetence. What's going to happen? Can you speak to that, Mandy? What could happen? What could happen when we start to address it with a partner, mm -hmm. especially a partner who is purposefully mischaracterizing, purposefully misunderstanding, who this is part of a game that they're playing. If your partner is just unaware, you know, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. This is a form of manipulation where the person is aware of what they're doing. So often setting boundaries um, doesn't work. You've tried yeah. and you've tried this way. You've tried that way. Mm -hmm. If you get into a situation where you really cannot seem to affect change in your world, what that tells you is that it's not just an imbalance of labor. It's an imbalance of power. 
Mm -hmm. This person has power over you and your situation and they're unwilling to address it. They are not open about um, change or criticism. They are, have black and white rigid thinking. They turn it into it's right or wrong or who's to blame. And you keep saying, I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying that it's about right and wrong. It has nothing to do with that. And they keep talking, you're talking in circles. At that point, you are with somebody who is invested in not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. And I would at that point try to find a professional who does understand your situation, these types of relationships. And it's important to select a professional who understands these types of relationships. And then that professional could help you then at that point navigate your circumstances. But every once in a while, you find a partner who really does want to help and change that they realize that the error of their ways and they see that it doesn't, it's not a good look for them to the outside world, whatever it is that inspires them to make the change. But if they are open and they are willing, mm -hmm. it is about the behaviors, the feelings and emotions that are the result of having been in the situation for a long time. Those can be dealt with and managed and processed, mm -hmm. but, in, but getting things done and functioning is really what you're focused on at a certain point. It's like, I I'll get to that. I just need the kids to get on the bus on time. Yeah. I just need the kids to get their medicine. Can you please just give the kids their medicine for me? Mm -hmm. And can you do it in the way that I do it so that they will take the medicine from you since they're so used to me doing it. And sticking with those those points, those key points, and being kind about it, mm -hmm. explanatory, um, reinforcing with positivity, you know, the compliment sandwich. I really love how you were so helpful this morning. And um, I am so impressed with your effort. And I see that we also need to adjust this one portion of what was done. The kids really enjoyed it. And it was helpful. Thank you so much. So be cautious of the way you're talking to your partner and that you're, you don't have a tone, um, that you're being supportive and positive with, with your partner as you try to make these changes. We have talked about weaponized incompetence. We talked about what it is specifically, who uses it, why they use it, the typical signs and indicators that it's happening so that you can identify it in your environment. Also, what problems it typically causes to the over-functioner, the person who is doing most of everything. What kind of problems does it cause for that person? And then what can be done about it? If anything, you know, what can be done? And then we just mentioned a situation where maybe nothing could be done, that this is as evolved as this human is going to get. Mm -hmm. They are dead set in that you're the bad guy and they're the good guy. And that, you know, or perhaps there's a cultural divide that this person comes from a culture that has a huge gender uh, power imbalance, that that's like a belief system that's ingrained in who they are. And if it's a cultural thing that isn't going to be shifted, know when you've lost the battle, know when to give up. Mm -hmm. on the battle and start focusing on you as much as possible. Often we get locked into this pattern with the person trying to correct their behavior and they have no intention of changing. And you're just, you're just boxing with windmills. It's not going anywhere. If you can recognize that that's happening, that will get you one step closer to finding a better environment for yourself that is more balanced and potentially even a future relationship with a partner who's actually a partner, who's actually a team member and who truly has your back. And as I promise to my clients on a regular basis, that person is out there. Mm -hmm. They are out there. Um, I know this for a fact. Mm -hmm. And we can find somebody who is a better fit for us. And until we do, is it harder this way or mm -hmm. is it harder just doing it all yourself, right. you know, which, which one's harder. Mm -hmm. I'd rather just do it myself. Same. <laughs> if I disappoint someone, it's only in disappointing myself. If I mess it up, I messed it up. Um, and then if I want it be, to be done, I know it gets done. 
So mm-hmm. I tend to be that I do it myself kind of person. Yep. Anyone that knows me knows that. Um, but then there's other people that they really don't want to do that. They don't feel good about that. I, I have a way of making that okay. It's empowering. Like I do it myself. Yeah. Um, but other people don't have that same kind of feeling about doing something on their own because of a history they have, where it's especially triggering for them to have to carry the load, you know, and for somebody that really, really, really is longing for a partner to be there for you. And you don't have that kind of a partner. There's only one way to correct that. And that's to clear the stage in your life for those healthy people to show up, to get the toxic stuff away from you so that healthy things start to be attracted to your situation. Because don't forget that it's like magnets. Healthy attracts healthy. Unhealthy repels healthy. So if we've got unhealthy things happening, but we want our world to be healthier, we got to clean up those unhealthy messes first. And then we can start creating the more healthy patterns with the healthier people. Right. Detoxification. Detoxification. Absolutely. It's possible that you are in the stage of detoxification and your recovery from narcissistic abuse. And it's going to require you to make some difficult changes. But the weaponized incompetence is something that has reared its head. And you're like, oh, I see it now. I see it. Tabitha, thank you so much for making this video with me. I was eager to introduce you to everyone because you've been doing such a great job. You've been really super helpful. I don't know if y'all been looking at our Facebook pages for Claremont Mental Health and my Facebook page, but we've had some really cool graphics that have been posted over the past few months. And that's Tabby doing all of that. She is very creative and brilliant and a hard worker. Uh, and just really, really um, a great person to work with and be around. So thanks, Tabby, for doing this video with me. Yeah, you're welcome. My pleasure. And thank you for watching or listening. Goodbye.